Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to U.S. History as we look today at the 1970s. And Gerald Ford is the only president never elected to the executive office. Even other vice presidents who became president had been elected by the Electoral College on a ticket with their running mate. But Ford was different. He was the first and so far only president chosen under the terms of the 25th Amendment, which describes how to pick a new vice president if for some reason you don't have your old one. In the case of Nixon, it was because his vice president, Spiro Agnew, had resigned um, from the vice presidency after being charged with taking bribes back when he was governor of Maryland and of not paying his income taxes as both governor and vice president. Nixon um, had then chosen Ford because he was a popular and uncontroversial member of Congress um, who he hoped would make the administration more popular and who he hoped Congress would be likely to confirm because while the president picks his new vice president under the 25th Amendment, he does also have to be confirmed by Congress, which Ford was easily. Um, when Ford was sworn in as president in 1974, the nation was deeply disillusioned by Watergate, um, by the Vietnam War, and by the economic problems of the 1970s known as stagflation, and all the social change of the 1960s and 70s, which troubled so many Americans, although for others, they felt they weren't going far enough. Ford was seen as a basically good and decent man who offered a chance to fix some of these problems, bridge some of the divides, maybe unease some of the disillusionment in America. But much of that goodwill was ruined almost immediately as one of Ford's first official actions was to give a full and complete pardon to Richard Nixon for anything Nixon might have done, not even specifically listing any crimes. So that Nixon never had to face an investigation for his involvement in the Watergate scandal or anything else he might or might not have done as president. Um, some people even suspected there might have been some corrupt bargain with Ford promising a pardon in exchange for becoming president. Um, and many people lost faith in Ford, feeling that he was corrupt as any other politician. From Ford's point of view, he simply wanted to bring our long national nightmare to an end. And many people felt he had sold out. And Ford also, just by chance, um, had the misfortune to make a couple stumbles um, and fall down the steps of Air Force One twice on television. Um, Ford was, in fact, an athlete. He'd been on the University of Michigan's national championship football team in 1932 and 1933, although some of his opponents suggested he played football without a helmet. But falling down the steps of Air Force One on television made him look clumsy, losing him even more respect, making him the butt of jokes across America. Um, he just as William Howard Taft is famous not for his role as governor of the Philippines or a trust buster or a reformer or a chief justice of the Supreme Court, but for supposedly getting stuck in the bathtub, Ford's famous for falling down. In part because he also had the misfortune to be the first president in office when a new show began to air, Saturday Night Live. And um, every Saturday on television, Chevy Chase fell down the steps pretending to be Gerald Ford. And of course, when Ford took office, the country was in a deep recession, while also suffering from inflation, in the combination we remember as uh, stagflation. This inflation and other problems were caused in part by the gas shortages um, that had uh, followed OPEC's embargo of oil to countries who had supported Israel during the Yom Kippur War. And so Ford may well have come into office facing the most difficult challenges for a new president since Franklin Roosevelt. But Ford was fairly conservative. Indeed, from Nixon through the end of the 20th century, pretty much all presidents would adopt conservative rhetoric and in general much more conservative actions than those uh, from Roosevelt through Lyndon Johnson. Um, even Democrats moved uh, in a more moderate or somewhat conservative direction in the late 20th century in response um, to what some saw as the excesses of the New Deal and the Great Society. 
And so Ford certainly doesn't believe in wide-ranging government spending of the sort that Roosevelt or Truman um, or Johnson might have done. His plan to fix the economy was um, a voluntary program called WIP Inflation Now, or WIN for short. The government made WIN buttons and encouraged people to wear them. Ford encouraged people to grow their own vegetables instead of buying overpriced food at the grocery store. Told people to save money rather than spend it, uh, in contrast to all economic advice today, which encourages American consumers to spend as much as they can. He encouraged Americans to save fuel um, by traveling less, by carpooling, by taking the bus. Turn off the lights when you leave the room. Turn off the faucet and the sink when you're not using it. But all of these were voluntary actions, which many people didn't necessarily take. Even had everyone taken them, their impact probably wouldn't have been that great. And when didn't have much impact overall, was one more thing about Ford's administration many people made fun of. Now, Ford and Congress did eventually pass a tax cut, um, as well as an increase in unemployment benefits. But when Congress tried to pass laws giving more funding um, to public housing, to education, to health care, and other forms of welfare, Ford vetoed many of those laws. There's even a joke that he vetoed so many things that once a leaf blew into the open window, and he, and he vetoed that. But Congress wasn't having it, and they overrode many of his vetoes, overturning a higher percentage of his vetoes than any Congress since the, that of Franklin Pierce's administration in the 1850s. Ford kept Nixon's Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, around and continued his policy of detente, improved relations with the Soviet Union, and to try to rebuild relations that had been strained during the Vietnam War uh, and following the Nixon shock. Ford visited many of America's foreign allies. He became the first sitting U.S. president to visit Japan which was just starting to become economically powerful, as they were now making reliable, fuel-efficient cars that competed with unreliable, inefficient American cars um, at it for the first time. Um, having finally learned how to make good cars at a time Americans during the fuel shortage were really desperate for good cars. Of course, Ford didn't have much choice but to pursue detente. Because in 1973, Congress had passed the War Powers Act, overriding Nixon's veto. This essentially took back the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution um, and gave the president, at least on paper, very limited powers to make war without an official declaration of war from Congress. The president can, because there might be an emergency, send troops overseas, but he has to notify Congress within 48 hours and Congress can, um, can bring those troops back at pretty much any point. Um, troops cannot stay overseas more than 60 days without congressional approval. Again, Congress can demand they be brought home at any time. And while over the years, presidents have learned they can largely ignore that and send troops overseas and then call Congress unpatriotic if they talk about bringing them back, at least in the 1970s, um, this really was seen as a limit on the president. And so Ford couldn't easily um, take military action, even if he wanted to. And he didn't want to. Um, in the spring of 1975, when the North Vietnamese Army moved into South Vietnam, capturing the city of Saigon, with the last Americans fleeing from the country um, in helicopters off the roof of the embassy. Um, but Ford couldn't really do much about this because the War Powers Act um, and public opinion in general um, blocked any action um, of meaning by Ford. And then things got worse. As in May of 1975, Cambodia, which had recently followed the communism, um, captured an American merchant ship, uh, the Maya Guez. Um, the U.S. did send forces to rescue Maya Guez and did recover the ship, but the rescue operation wasn't run that well. The U.S. had 41 men killed. And while it did show the U.S. would still defend ourselves if really pushed, which some people question, it showed we might not be able to do it that well. 
military performance um, was in poor shape in the 1970s due to budget cuts and falling morale after the Vietnam War. And many Americans were disillusioned with more than politics. The 1970s were called the time, and sometimes since, um, the me decade. Um, baby boomers, who had grown up in the easy life of the 1950s and early 60s, were now safe from the draft. They were influenced by the free love and the drug use of 1960s and seemed to be focused on themselves, ignoring traditional morality, but also turning away from the political activism that had been so important to the counterculture of the 1960s. The divorce rate more than uh, doubled between 1965 and 1979, as did the number of babies born outside of marriage at the time seen as a very shocking thing. Um, today, uh, often viewed as, as nothing outside the ma regular matter of course. Roe versus Wade had legalized abortion nationwide in 1973, um, pleasing some Americans and horrifying others. The war on drugs began during Nixon's presidency, outlawing many um, drugs or limiting them through the Controlled Substances Act, passed in 1970, although a number of particularly famous drugs like marijuana, heroin, and LSD were already illegal. And while the Controlled Substances Act was definitely about public health, for Nixon too it was a way to attack his enemies, another way to do so, by associating the counterculture and the anti-war movement with marijuana. He could use a raise, um, on marijuana use as a way to attack hippies by associating African Americans with crack cocaine. He could use uh, in drug raids to attack black leaders. Um, so it had multiple purposes. But in response to what seemed to be declining morality and growing selfishness, there was also a rise in religious fundamentalism uh, as kind of a backlash to some of the Supreme Court cases and other social changes of the 1960s. By 1980, 20% of Americans identified as religious fundamentalists, wanting to follow the literal words of the Bible, in, in large part as a backlash against the changes of the 60s and 70s, and inspired by um, preachers on television, televangelists as they were known, who in increasingly encouraged religious Americans to get involved in politics. Men like Jerry Falwell, Pat Robertson, um, Oral Roberts, and others um, encouraged, uh, encouraged Americans to be more publicly religious and to push for laws such uh, as a return to prayer in public schools, an end to abortion. Um, they hoped the government would somehow do something about um, the rising divorce rate and rising birth rate of illegitimate children. During the me decade, many people turned to self-improvement, um, perhaps an upside to self-centeredness. Exercise, um, particularly jogging, became popular. People jogged in the past because they were made to do it during basic training for the Army um, or training for athletic events, but jogging is just kind of a hobby um, for personal health developed in the 1970s. Bodybuilding and the health food movement um, became big too. Um, people kind of associate natural living with the hippies, but they weren't necessarily interested in health food um, the way people were in the 1970s and later. And as bad as things were, um, there was for some people a bright spot in the decade. In 1976, the nation celebrated its bicentennial the 200th anniversary of the signing of the Declaration of Independence, with fireworks and parades and hundreds of sailing ships sailing through New York Harbor under the Statue of Liberty. To some extent, at least briefly, restoring people's hope and faith and love for their country after the disappointment of Watergate. Of course, 1976 was also an election year, and Gerald Ford ran um, as the Republican candidate although he had been challenged in some primaries uh, by the governor of California, Ronald Reagan. Um, but many Americans um, felt sick of the professional politicians in Washington 
they felt were too corrupt to run the country. Um, again, ne having never been elected president or even vice president, um, Ford didn't really have the base of power and support that, some, that um, others did. Um, but above all, there was a backlash against what was seen as the corrupt politics of Washington, as Americans elected a Democrat um, who had never had any national political experience. Jimmy Carter, who had been an engineer in the U.S. Navy's nuclear submarine program, and then gotten involved um, in politics in his home state of Georgia, eventually becoming governor of that state, um, ran in large part as a political outsider. And also as a man who is a born-again Baptist was deeply religious, um, and very openly so, in a way that appealed to many Americans. Um, and so he was elected in 1976. Um, and Carter was, uh, certainly presented himself, but I think genuinely was, I'm a down-home kind of guy. Um, he made a point of walking the entire inaugural parade route rather um, than riding in a limousine, um, which made it, would have made him seem distant from the people. Um, and of course, a limousine by that point would have been armored. The 1960s had seen uh, assassinations of John F. Kennedy, his brother Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X, and other prominent figures. There had been um, two assassination attempts on Gerald Ford um, about a week apart in the 1970s. Fortunately, pretty incompetent um, assassination attempts. One by Squeaky Frome, part of Charles Manson's cult. Um, the other, um, just a, a disgruntled middle-aged woman named Sarah Jane Moore, who said afterwards, I didn't have anything against Ford, but you know, it was the 70s, was basically her explanation. Um, but Carter is, is one of the people. He trusts the people, unlike Nixon, he has nothing to hide. As president, Carter appointed more women, more blacks, more Latinos to government positions than any president before him had ever done. On the other hand, during the economic troubles of the 70s, um, and showing kind of a trend towards a more conservative approach to government, he felt it was necessary to cut government spending um, to save money which might let him lower taxes and reduce the federal debt. But this did involve cutting um, some welfare programs or reducing them, cutting some other government spending, um, which of course was unpopular with some Americans. Um, and while he had supported civil rights in some ways, there are others who said he still didn't do enough. In particular, that he didn't do enough to support the idea of affirmative action begun under Lyndon Johnson, um, of providing some preferences um, in employment and, and university admission to women and minorities who've been discriminated against in the past, but which some people said was reverse discrimination, giving preference to non-white people. And this was challenged, um, and Carter didn't do much to uh, uh, fight against those challenges. A particularly important Supreme Court case was the case of Regents of the University of California versus Mackey in 1978, um, which banned using racial quotas for college admissions. A number of colleges have said if we're going to, uh, to guarantee admission of dis groups discriminated against, we'll simply admit a specific number of various races. Um, and this rule that was unconstitutional although it did say colleges could still consider race um, as an aspect of admissions, saying diversity on campus was a good thing, but there couldn't be specific racial quotas. And later Supreme Court decisions have often limited affirmative action further, although sometimes upheld it. Carter deregulated many industries, saving the government money because it no longer had to supervise them and making them more competitive. Carter once said that his greatest accomplishment as president was deregulating the airlines, which did lead um, to falling prices uh, through more competition um, in uh, commercial air travel. But in some industries, less regulation also led to uh, unsafe conditions or other problems. Of course, one of the biggest problems for America 
and was the energy crisis. Um, of course, in the early 70s, um, gas had written, well, over the course of the 1970s, the price of a gallon of gas rose from 40 cents in 1973 to $1.20 in 1979, which may not sound like so much today, but it accounted for a bigger percentage of people's income spent on fuel than almost any other point in American history, um, aside from some brief oil shortages um, after uh, Hurricane Katrina in the 21st century. Um, and there are also fears among many scientists that the world was running out of oil and natural gas and other resources. Indeed, many were expected to run out by the end of the 20th century. Um, and so Carter, wanting to uh, reduce prices and also reduce dependence on foreign oil, encouraged Americans to drive less, told them to turn down their heat, use their air conditioning less, wear a sweater if you're cold. He created new, uh, a new cabinet position, the Department of Energy, to supervise America's energy resources. Um, he taxed the sale of inefficient cars, deregulated oil and natural gas prices, hoping that competition would lower them, and spent money developing solar and nuclear power. Carter and many Americans thought nuclear power was the answer to the energy crisis. It had the potential to be a clean, cheap, and basically unlimited source of energy. Um, although, in fact, at least in the U.S., we've never really found a way to make it cheaper than coal-burning power plants or hydroelectricity, although some countries seem to do pretty well with nuclear power. Furthermore, many people opposed the use of nuclear power, as some people connected it with nuclear weapons, which, of course, were very unpopular with the anti-war movement and some worried about its safety in general. Um, fears that some felt were justified following uh, the accident at Three Mile Island near Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. In March of 1979, there was a partial meltdown and a small radiation leak at this nuclear power plant not too far from Pennsylvania's state capital. Um, and the effects were actually pretty limited, but when people nearby heard about it, um, it scared a lot of people. Um, and just by pure coincidence, um, a movie called The China Syndrome had just come out around this time. Um, the China Syndrome was about a major nuclear power plant meltdown. The idea of the China Syndrome being a bad enough nuclear meltdown could cause a nuclear plant to melt all the way through the Earth to China, which of course is impossible. But this movie coming out at the same time as this um, small disaster frightened a lot of people away from nuclear power. To try to deal with these fears, um, Carter, who had originally favored deregulation, now tried to regulate nuclear power more through a nuclear regulatory commission, which already existed, but he reorganized it and tried to strengthen it in hoping to regulate and promote nuclear power. But since then, um, very few new nuclear plants, I think maybe just one, have been authorized for construction in the U.S. Although a number that had already been authorized could have been completed um, since Three Mile Island. But if Carter's support for nuclear energy, um, his lack of support for affirmative action, his cuts to some government spending programs angered liberals, he also angered some conservatives by offering an amnesty to almost everyone who had dodged the draft in Vietnam. If you were actually in actual service and deserted, you were still in trouble. But if you had fled to Canada or otherwise avoided being drafted completely, um, Carter offered amnesty um, to well over 100,000 draft dodgers, in which angered many people, but um, there were many families who were separated in the 1960s and early 70s and not seen their draft dodging relatives for years um, were now reunited, um, making this, for many people, a popular move. In foreign affairs, Carter had some huge successes um, and a couple huge failures. Um, 
His first major foreign policy would be a group of treaties known as the Corrijos Carter Treaties, um, ratified in 1977 between the United States and Panama. Um, these treaties agreed to return the Panama Canal uh, and the canal zone around it to Panama. Um, the canal zone was returned to Panama in 1979. The Panama Canal itself became Panamanian territory December 31st, 1999. Um, although, although the treaties required that the canal remain neutral, open to all the world's shipping, and if Panama should ever cut it off, the U.S. could step right back in to open the canal. Many Panamanians welcomed the transfer of the canal back, although some resented the fact they didn't have complete control, um, the neutrality treaty aspect. And some Americans were unhappy. Strom Thurmond in the Senate said the canal is ours. We bought and we paid for it and we should keep it. But from Carter's point of view, this would improve relations with Latin America, who had been fairly resentful of the U.S. Um, since the 1950s, if not perhaps longer. Plus, the Pan Panama Canal had originally been, in large part, about allowing the U.S. Navy to travel from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean, um, as well as merchant trade. By this point, though, many of America's largest naval vessels, certainly our aircraft carriers, couldn't fit through the Panama Canal and some of the world's largest cargo ships couldn't either. So it really didn't have the strategic importance for the U.S. Navy it once did. And so improving relations with Latin America was maybe not as costly as it seemed um, when the canal was given up, uh, yeah, along with the canal zone. Um, Israel, as we've mentioned, had fought a number of wars with her Arab neighbors. In 1948 and during the Suez Crisis, and most recently during the Six-Day War of 1967, when Israel had seized quite a bit of territory um, from neighboring countries. Um, and then, six years after that, in the Yom Kippur War, um, Israel had been attacked again. Once again, Israel held off the attackers, although in this case at least didn't gain any more land. But tension was still high in the Middle East, um, and most Arab countries hated Israel. Indeed, no Arab country officially recognized Israel as a country, officially viewing Israel as a big Jewish plot. But, because that did contribute to instability in the Middle East, Carter wanted to deal with this problem. And 1978, in, um, actually in 1977, began negotiations um, with the president of Egypt. Anwar Sadat, and the Prime Minister of Israel, Menachem Begin. In 1978, he invited them to Camp David, the President's private retreat in Maryland, where they worked out the Camp David Accords, creating peace between Israel and Egypt, um, in which Egypt officially recognized Israel, the first uh, Arab country to do so, but as the most populous, and in many ways the most influential Arab country, at least at that time, this encouraged other Arab countries to at least unofficially build better relations with Israel too, or at least be less aggressive. Indeed, there has been no major invasion of Israel, um, or certainly attacked by multiple Arab neighbors ever since. Of course, Egypt didn't do this just to be nice, although it certainly improved their relations with the U.S. too. Israel um, gave up something of their own, specifically agreeing to withdraw from the Sinai Peninsula gradually over the next few years, which they did, um, returning to Egypt a lot of territory they'd lost in 1967, Israel basically giving up about half their territory, or maybe more. Um, as well as access to some oil reserves, but gaining peace in the process. Although this was still controversial, the president of Egypt, Anwar Sadat, uh, was murdered by Arab extremists not long after uh, signing these accords. But it was a step towards some peace in the Middle East. But not everything will go so well. When Carter took office, 
detente still existed between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. But during his presidency, Carter saw it as his moral duty to speak out um, against the Soviet Union's suppression of human rights, um, something that Carter or that Nixon um, had had no particular problem with, thanks to his policy of real politics. But when some people in the Soviet Union and countries dominated by the Soviet Union um, began seeking um, freedom of speech and other rights, Carter criticized Brezhnev, leader of the Soviet Union, for denying them those rights. Um, an increasing tension between the U.S. and the Soviets, although it would be the Soviets who would push things beyond the point of no return, invading Afghanistan in 1979, uh, in principle, to support a communist revolution there that had overthrown the Shah, or king of Afghanistan, the previous year. Carter told Brezhnev the invasion of Afghanistan was a threat to world peace and asked him to withdraw. So did the United Nations. All the United Nations couldn't take any peacekeeping actions because the Soviets would have blocked that with their veto. The Soviets ignored complaints by the U.S. and the U.N. Um, and others and ended up in a very long running war um, in Afghanistan. In many ways, this was for the Soviet Union what the Vietnam War was for the United States, as the Soviets soon ended up fighting a guerrilla war or against a guerrilla war as various groups of freedom fighters known as Mujahideen um, fought against the Soviet Union, um, typically with help from outsiders. The U.S. supported a number of these Mujahideen groups, including one who would later govern all of Afghanistan, uh, known as the Taliban, um, a move that perhaps we would regret later on. In a diplomatic protest, the U.S. and about 60 other countries um, boycotted the 1980 Summer Olympics, which were held in Moscow as a sign of disapproval of Soviet uh, policy in Afghanistan. And while this may not seem like such a big deal, the Cold War was so much a war of ideas and a war of public relations, trying to win hearts and minds around the world, um, that even an embarrassment of this type, the boycott of your Olympics, um, was a major diplomatic event. Of course, in 1984, the Summer Olympics were in Los Angeles, and the Soviet Union uh, and its satellites in Eastern Europe uh, boycotted those Olympics. Detente um, ended in 1979. There would be trouble elsewhere in 1979. The United States had supported the Shah of Iran for decades, and the Shah had a number of points going for him. Um, he had tried to modernize Iran had built um, some industry, had modernized some parts of the country in a number of ways. In theory, he had created a constitutional monarchy with a secular government based on written laws created um, by modern politicians, not religious laws, as were so common in some parts of the Middle East. And most importantly, he was firmly anti-communist, which is why the U.S. supported him despite some problems, because while in principle he led a constitutional monarchy, in reality he dissolved parliament when it disagreed with him, repressed his people. He had secret police um, who would arrest, imprison, torture, murder his opponents. Um, he spent tax money on his own luxuries, um, having gold-plated telephones in his palace, um, and money on a big military at a time when many Iranians remained poor. And while he did launch a number of reforms, many didn't go far enough, or at least his opponents said so. Um, and many Muslim religious leaders um, resented the fact that their power had diminished um, under the Shah, and didn't like the fact that he was pro-American at a time when many Muslims resented America's support for Israel. And so, in January of 1979, a revolution broke out in Iran. Um, which would have a number of phases, as different groups at first worked together against the Shah. He was opposed by three main groups, a group we might 
described broadly as liberals in the sense of wanting liberty, in wanting rights under the Constitution, who resented the fact that he did so often ignore the Constitution. There are also communists opposed to the Shah, who resented his anti-communism in general, and particularly the fact that he was so rich when many of his people were so poor. And there were religious fundamentalists who wanted to make Iran um, an Islamic fundamentalist country. But first, liberals, communists, and fundamentalists cooperated. But once the Shah was forced out of the country, the communists and the fundamentalists turned on the liberals, killing many of the liberals. Once they were gone, the fundamentalists turned on the communists, killing many of them. So that, over the course of 1979, Iran became an Islamic Republic. And the Shah fled to the United States, officially for medical treatment, but also to avoid, um, presumably, um, execution and possibly torture. Iran asked for the Shah back, and the U.S. refused to return him. Carter, knowing that he would likely be killed if he were sent back home, he in fact died of natural causes in 1980. Um, but the U.S. and Iran remained enemies. And so, during the uh, revolution, um, a group of Iranian students invaded and seized the U.S. embassy, holding a number of its staff hostage. Um, for uh, 444 days. Um, the American hostages were often mistreated, sometimes beaten, sometimes left in solitary confinement, sometimes told they would be executed and, took, and taken to stand somewhere all day, supposedly to wait for the firing squad to come, but then taken back to their rooms at the end of the day. But it's certainly a form of psychological torture. Carter attempted a military rescue, sending in... Um, special forces by helicopter, but a sandstorm caused many of the helicopters to crash, a huge embarrassment for Carter and the U.S. Um, the Iranian Revolution also disrupted the world's oil markets, creating a new oil crisis in 1979, making America's economic problems even worse. And the hostage crisis was a major issue in 1980, um, presidential election, when Jimmy Carter was challenged by Ronald Reagan, a former actor, former governor of California. He was, pop um, he was popular, he was funny, uh, as an actor he knew how to tell a good story, and he blamed Carter for the country's loss of prestige, um, particularly the imprisonment of 52 Americans in Iran. Um, in the election of 1980, Carter lost in a landslide. And to spite Carter, Iran um, held its hostages um, until just a few moments after Reagan took the oath of office, holding them on a plane to take off from Tehran airport as soon as Reagan was sworn in, so Carter could not uh, claim any kind of victory in their release. 